you will have it. And welcome everyone to Conflict Resolution is Not an Oxymoron. Thank you for joining us at the end of the month as we talk about conflict this morning and how we engage with conflict, how we think about conflict, and truly looking at how we at Nashville State and in our lives as we live every single day, think about conflict and engage with conflict. So let's start with big picture. What does conflict look like? What is conflict? And so a conflict is simply an express struggle. And we probably have felt this this week. Research shows that average Americans are gonna have seven conflicts a day. So you may have already felt this this morning. So I want you to know that conflict is an express struggle. You know there's a disagreement with the other person. So something's going on where things aren't aligning. You're not on the same page. You're not going in the same direction with each other. And that leads us to perceived incompatible goals. We perceive that the other person's goals are standing in the way of us reaching our goals. And this is important because we also perceive scarce resources. And so those scarce resources and scarce rewards may be time. It could be getting a job that we're going for. It could be just being able to work in the workplace nicely together. And so when we look at conflict, it's important for us to recognize that it's an interdependent process. So it involves at least two people and it's an active process. And so we engage in it, hopefully. We're going to talk about some ways that we sometimes know it's happening, but don't engage in it. But we need to recognize that conflict is inevitable. And I want everybody to pause here for a second. Conflict is inevitable. That means when we're in a conflict, it's not bad. Conflicts are going to happen. It could be about what you're going to eat for supper tonight or what you're going to do this weekend. But conflicts are inevitable. And if we can change our mindset, as we were talking a little bit before the session began, to recognize that conflicts are going to occur, it can change the way we approach them and the way we engage with those conflicts to be able to engage with them better. And so we want to, now that we understand what conflicts are, look at the five basic conflict styles. And Amy, if I can just jump in um, Absolutely. before we talk about these, as we're talking about these, you all, this, this can be you and a coworker, you and a student, you and your significant other, you and a family member. So this is definitely a workshop that, you know, of course we want you to use it at work, but we also want you to recognize the value in your daily life. Because as Amy said, most of us have at least seven, and again, hopefully they're minor conflicts a day. So being able to use this information and apply it in our daily lives, uh, you know, we want you to know it's beneficial, not just here in the workplace. Seven conflicts a day on average. That means some of us are overachievers and we're having 10 to 15 a day, not the area we want to overachieve in, but... We look at these five conflict styles, and I want to give you kind of a base definition right off the bat for these, and then we're going to do a little activity before we go a little bit deeper. So the first conflict style is competing. Competition. I win, you lose. Easy definition for you, right? And you can change it so that you are winning, right? I win, you lose. With competition, the goal is I want to win. The second style, avoiding. I lose, you lose. With avoiding, we know a conflict's occurring. We really don't want to deal with it. So we kind of pretend it's not there, but it doesn't go away. So I lose, the other person engaged in the conflict also loses. With accommodating, I lose so you can win. With accommodating, we're going to put the other person's needs, wants, and ideas above our own. The fourth is the collaborative style or the problem solver. With collaborating, it's I win, you win. Everybody gets to win. Now my competitors right now are going, hold on. I don't know if that's possible. And that's okay. So breathe with me a minute. We're going to get there. But when we look at collaborating, the goal is everybody's needs, wants, and desires are met. And then the last style is compromising. Compromising is I win and lose, you win and lose. With compromising, we meet each other in the middle. We meet each other halfway. 
Now, many times when we teach this in class, our students get really excited and think it's a multiple choice test. And I want you to know before we go any further, there's not a style that's best. Each style has consequences. And so what we want to do right now before we go deeper is to allow you to take the conflict styles assessment. And with this conflict styles assessment, I'm dropping the link directly into chat if you want to click on it, or you can use your handy dandy device and scan the QR code. You're going to be able to, for the next five minutes, we're going to pause the recording, and we want you to go through these 30 questions. Some are going to get repetitive towards the end, that's okay, to figure out what your default or most used conflict style is. So if you will, we're going to pause the recording here. Instead, as we look at our results, we want to think about what our default style is. Our default style is going to be the percentage that was highest for you. I like to call it the comfortable sweatshirt, right? That one sweatshirt that on the weekend you love, it feels comfortable and you enjoy it. It's what's natural for you. Now, when you look down and you see your lowest percentage on your results, that's going to be the itchy sweater that doesn't feel right. And when you put it on, it just kind of crawls all over you and it doesn't feel natural to you. It doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means we have to work harder to use it and be more mindful to be able to use it. And so we can look at these five styles that we've introduced and that we kind of know where we fall on based on concern for others. And so competition, again, is I win, you lose. And so it's the win-lose approach to conflict. You've got great concern for your own needs, wants, and desires, and low concern for other people. And so as you see on our lovely cartoon here, it's not enough that we succeed. The other person has to fail. And so there has to be a winner in the situation. Now, if you're a competitor, you go in to win. And guys, it feels good to win. It's awesome to win. You feel good. You get your needs, wants, and desires met. And life is pretty great. But if we're thinking about our workplace and our coworkers, if we're always winning, what does that mean the other person's doing? The other coworkers are. Mm -hmm, they're losing. Does it feel great to lose all the time? No. And so part of what we have to think about if competitions are high style, that's not a bad thing. But we also have to recognize the impact that it has on our relationships. Because if we're always making other people feel like losers, are they going to want to spend time with us? Are they going to come and ask us questions? Are they going to seek us out for new projects? The answer is going to be no. And so what we need to be able to do as high competitors is to really be mindful about the situation. Now to look at it from another perspective that's really important. If we recognize that someone else's default style is competition, it can help us interpret the way they communicate better. So if a student has a high competition conflict style and is in your office, they may be using really powerful language. They may be making big gestures. That doesn't mean they're being rude. It doesn't mean that they hate you but it could be that they think it's a competition and somebody has to win and somebody wants to lose and we know losing doesn't feel good. And so you're able to take a step back from the situation and say, they're not mad at me, they're upset about the conflict. And as a result, you can look at it from a new perspective as you start managing that conflict. So let's go deeper and look at avoidance. Avoidance is lose-lose. With avoidance, we're pretending the conflict doesn't exist. And just like dust in my house, I can pretend it doesn't exist, but it doesn't go away. It multiplies and multiplies. And so we have to recognize that if we avoid, we're going to start having an unsatisfying relationship. Because that dust is piling up. And the things that I'm really frustrated about when my coworker 
with my friends, with my family, they start piling up too. Notice we're not talking about them. We're not communicating about them. We're kind of pretending they're not there, but it gets heavy. And it doesn't lead to a satisfying relationship because we're not dealing with the mess and cleaning out the dust. Our third style, our collaborators, the problem solvers. Oh, I'm so sorry. Avoidance can be helpful at some times. Thank you, Neelan. If you're in a meeting and your boss announces something that you don't think is logical or makes sense, it may not be the best time in front of 40 people to raise your hand and say, that's not logical. It doesn't make sense. It may make sense after the meeting to go up and say, hey, I didn't understand this very well. Can we talk about it later? It could be something's temporary. You're having to deal with a situation where your office is moving. Well, okay, that's all right. You may not like it. You can't change it. So it's temporary. You pack up the boxes, you move, you live with it, and then it's okay. I want to stress with each of these styles, there's positives and negatives that can come. But if we get stuck only using one style, it has tremendous impact on the people that we use and the people that we engage with and the people we communicate with and work with. And I know when I say that, when we look at collaboration, people are like, um, I don't think there's a lose to here. A lot of times in the multiple choice test, students are like, ooh, pick this one, everybody wins. If everybody wins, it's always great. Well, we sometimes can't do all win-win situations. With win-win situations, we have high degree of concern for everybody's needs, everybody's wants, everybody's desires, and we try to solve the problems together. It's wonderful. But collaboration takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of communication. And a cooperative problem solving is very rare because people get tired and frustrated with each other. And so they're like, okay, well, we'll just give some stuff up and we'll compromise. It's also important to note win-win's not always appropriate. Sometimes the conflict involves values, it involves ethics, it involves beliefs, that there's no room for the two different sides to come together. And so collaboration can be great. And it's wonderful because it's a win-win situation. But we can't always go into it saying, okay, we're just going to collaborate. It's going to be wonderful. In certain contexts, it's not going to be possible. Accommodation, lose-win. With accommodation, I lose, you win. We allow other people to have their way instead of asserting our own point of view, our own beliefs, our own values, our own needs, wants, and desires. Now, accommodation really can enhance our relationships. Parents in this room, you accommodate. You go to ball practices, you go to dance recitals, you go to all of these things that you may not care anything about. Why? Because you love your family. Sometimes we do it with our coworkers. Oh, yes, negotiating bedtime's a wonderful one, Nicole. But sometimes we accommodate our coworkers. Somebody needs to leave early because they have a birthday party to celebrate, but there's a project that has to be done. And so you help out, you lose, you go home late so the project can get done so somebody else can leave. That's a big enhancement to a relationship, right? It shows value, it shows connection, it shows caring but it can also lead to resentment. Because if we accommodate and we accommodate and we accommodate, you never get to win. And just like we said with competitors earlier, winning feels good, losing doesn't feel as good. With accommodation, if we're always losing, we start to wonder, does anybody care? Does anybody notice what I'm doing? I'm over here being awesome. And nobody notices. Some of you are like, how is Amy in my head right now? Uh-huh. With accommodation, tough love. 
So be prepared. It's really hard for people to know with accommodation what you need if you never voice it. I know that sounds hard for our accommodators, but if we're always giving and we're always giving and we're always giving and you never say, I could really use help with, I really need somebody's assistance with, I'd really like to watch Hocus Pocus 2 tonight, whatever. Putting those out there, allow people to hear your needs, wants, and desires. And accommodators, with love, many times you give in before you voice. Compromise. Whew. Compromise can be negotiated lose-lose. We like to call it win-lose sometimes. You get a little bit, but you give a little bit. And so you get some of what you want, but you have to sacrifice something. And so a compromise, it saves some time because we meet each other halfway. We don't have to try to meet everybody's needs. Everybody gives up something. It's okay, but we have to recognize that there may be some costs there because the cost may be great if you have to compromise your values and your beliefs. Some compromises make you feel like you didn't get the best part. It's kind of like cutting up a cookie. When you divide a cookie, somebody's like, their side has more sprinkles than my side had. Well, you both got cookie, right? But I wanted more sprinkles. Yeah, we both had lunch, but she got to eat outside and I had to eat at my desk. When we look at compromises, when we look at the win-lose that's there, we get a little bit, but we also have to recognize the cost that comes with losing. We've spent a lot of time laying some definitions in this first 20 minutes together. What we want to do now is really talk about how we use these styles and how we put this conflict resolution into practice. And I'm going to pass to Neely. And we want to stress they all have value. Um, Amy reviewed some of the positives or reasons to use each style and some of the disadvantages. And so that's why taking your own assessment gives you a view of your high scores or things you already do well. You already know how to use those styles. Again, it's like she said, your comfortable sweatshirt. Those are the things you learned growing up. They're part of your frame of reference. So that's what you're going to default to using and you already know how to do that. Your lower scores are the ones that you want to learn to develop and use depending on the situation. So when we talk about which style to use, you know, there is no one best way. Uh, if there was, if there were a bunch of absolutes for communication, Amy, myself, Harlan, we probably wouldn't have a teaching job because, well, it would just all be easy. Uh, but the reality of it is, is communication depends on the context and the situation. And when we look at that, a couple things that we really want to think about when we're dealing with conflict. And you all, again, this can be with a student, a significant other, family member, coworker, your boss. Um, we want to think about the other person. What is the status of the relationship? Is there a power distribution there that's different? Uh, if I'm dealing with a conflict with my boss, I hopefully I'm looking at it differently than if I'm dealing with a conflict with Amy, because there are roles there that are different. Uh, if I'm having a conflict with my best friend, it's going to be different than a conflict with a new friend. And I say it's going to be really what I should be saying is, is it should be. We don't want to just default to our style. Uh, for example, I'm an accommodator through and through. Uh, if, if I could just, I just accommodate all the time. I want everybody to be happy. Yay. But that can be very detrimental if that's what I use all the time and given a other person. If I constantly do that, then that's going to cause resentment in the relationship. Um, what are my goals? Is my goal to win? Is it one of those situations that Amy talked about where you need to use co competition? There's going to be a winner. Maybe you're deciding on a textbook and everybody's sharing ideas and you know some agree, some disagree. But at the end of the day, if there's going to be a choice, uh, then and it's really important to me, then my goal really might be focused on winning. Uh, if my goal is to establish and maintain healthy relationships with my colleagues, and I'm not really that invested one way or the other, and I'm okay with a few of the textbooks, then the goal of working with my colleagues and getting along with my colleagues might be the primary thing that I'm looking at. Again, there's not one right goal. It's for us to internally look at 
what am I trying to accomplish here? And what's the most important thing? I should say your primary goal. Uh, but really in the communication world, how we label this or talk about it is you always want to think about the context. And this is not just for conflict, but we'll stay focused on conflict today. You all the communication environment. It's the time, it's, <clears throat> it's the place, it's the people involved, it's the cultural expectations. What is going on in that environment? And that should help us decide which style to use. Is it the right time? Is it the right place? Who am I talking with? And that should help us decide, should I be accommodating right now? Should I be avoiding right now? Is this really important that we go ahead and compromise because we're running out of time and collaboration is just not gonna work because we don't have the time? If we learn to stop and think before we speak, before we have the conflict, the idea is that we will make different decisions, possibly, hopefully better decisions instead of just defaulting to whatever your high score is. Again, if I, even from teaching communication for 25 years, if I don't think about conflict before it gets started, I am going to naturally default to accommodating. That's the style I'm most comfortable with. And again, that might be okay in some situations, but if I use that all the time, it's not going to help my relationships. Uh, again, resentment and all kinds of things. It depends on what your style is uh, that the downside can be. So we can think about those elements, but we also want to think about things that can influence our choice of conflict strategies. And again, as I mentioned, your goal, you all, your emotional state, the other person's emotional state, please, please think about um, how many of you have had a conflict that uh, it got emotional, intense, and you continued with it anyway, and it escalated. And maybe you think, oh, I wish I could have gotten that back, or stop that, or why didn't I pause? Really think about what is going on. Uh, you know, sometimes we have those students that really get provoked. And if you're paying attention, you can see that they are emotionally stressed. They get tense. Sometimes they even say things that maybe you think, wow, I can't believe they just said that. Sometimes the best option is temporary avoidance you know what, let's take a pause. I don't think this is the best time to talk about this. Um, yeah, especially if it's in the classroom, right? Uh, can you see me after class or let's set up a time to talk about this? Because if that happens in the classroom and that person by nature is competitive and the emotional state gets escalated, how can we expect a good outcome from that? Um, and sometimes it's easy to think, well, I'm the teacher, so I'm in charge and they shouldn't be doing that in the classroom. Well, that's true. Sometimes your kids will do something they shouldn't do. Sometimes we'll do things or say things we shouldn't. Conflict is about looking and assessing and figuring out what's the best option here. Uh, and thinking about the emotional states, um, important. And again, that goes along with assessing the situation and the context. Where are you? What's the time? What's the place? Who's involved? Um, this is important for us to realize. Our personality does influence our choice of conflict strategies. But that doesn't mean we don't have the opportunity to develop the other styles. And that is sometimes misunderstood, or maybe we use it as a way of just getting out. You know, well, by nature, I'm a pleaser and I like to make people happy. So I'm an accommodator and that's just what I am. Uh, it's not genetic, you all. We can learn all of these skills. Uh, I, I wouldn't teach communication <laughs> if it was something that we can't learn, because uh, basically I'd be teaching students something that they were born with and they don't have an option to change. So, yes. Personality can influence it, but we have the opportunity to develop these skills if we're paying attention. Communication competence, how competent are we as a communicator? Uh, showing up for this workshop, learning about conflict styles, learning about you have the opportunity to make different choices and use different styles. Uh, that makes you more competent as a communicator. In our communication classes, that's ultimately our goal uh, is with the concepts that we teach is to help our students have more knowledge, expertise, and skills that they have available to them so that they can be, become more competent. So the more competent you are, obviously the choices, uh, it's gonna impact your choices you make in conflict. <laughs> and I'm sure this is no surprise to any of you, but your family history is gonna influence whatever style number you had the highest. Uh, you know, that's what you learned growing up, being able to recognize that. Well, most of us mirror what we learned growing up. In some situations, if you absolutely hated it, uh, you might switch to something that's opposite. But most of us mirror what we learned growing up. So being able to identify that, look at that, recognize this is what I learned. 
So this is what I'm good at. Yay. But also these are the areas that I still need to work on is going to help us with our conflict resolution. So when we think about those things, um, I, I want to talk about a few. Uh, they're called the Four Horsemen. It's Toxic Conflict Resolution. This is by Gottman, uh, leading expert specialist in relationships and conflict. And there are four things that we need to be aware of uh, or stay away from. There's criticism, and we're going to look at the positive side or what to use instead in just a moment. Criticism is when we attack the character of the other person. Defensiveness, and this happens, I think, to all of us. We deny responsibility or we start thinking about the counterattack or why that person is wrong. Contempt, I don't think we consciously think I want to belittle or demean someone, but when we get triggered, that can happen. And then stonewalling, especially those of you who, with a higher avoidance score, there's a good chance that this might be a focus area, withdrawing or shutting down the dialogue. I peace out, not doing this. Uh, you put up a wall so you don't even give the opportunity. So when we look at the antidotes is what Gottman calls them. We have our four negative, unhelpful behaviors, but then we're given these just, they seem like common sense. If we can just stop and pause and think about it. instead of verbally attacking the other person or their character, we start about thinking about, our feelings and I voice, and we focus on the content and not the person. So instead of the person being stupid, maybe it's, I'm having a hard time seeing how that idea is going to work. Can we talk about that? So the antidotes don't mean you don't address conflict. It doesn't mean that you agree with people all the time. It doesn't mean that you avoid it. It means you put it in a different framework. Instead of contempt, we try and remind ourselves of our partner, or our coworker, our boss, whoever it is we're having conflict with, positive qualities and find positive actions or solutions instead of just the negative. Uh, when we start getting into contempt, it's like our little lens gets smaller and smaller and smaller and all we can see then are the negative traits or the negative things instead of big picture. This is just a conflict about a thing. It's not about a person. Defensiveness. I know for myself and, you know, a lot of research shows taking responsibility is hard because uh, we like to justify, explain ourselves. That's not really true. And we get in that cycle instead of just looking at it and what responsibility can I take for this situation? Uh, if you've actually done something, it means apologizing. <laughs> I know that can be uncomfortable, but even if it's just taking responsibility for how you contributed to maybe something escalating in a negative way. Doesn't mean if someone else had a behavior that you are wanting an apology for that you take accountability for that. But again, you take any responsibility that you might have in that situation. You all in our conflicts, it usually takes two people to be involved to create a conflict. So if you're highly competitive, sometimes this is kind of like hard to see because you don't you think you don't have any responsibility because well you're right and you want to win but in conflict there there's two sides there's at least two people involved and then stonewalling you all to me the best way to try and stay away from stonewalling is think about what that feels like when someone does that to you uh, when they shut you out they put up a wall you don't have the opportunity to talk about it uh, it can make you feel so much worse so recognizing that hopefully keeps us from doing it as often and realize that it is okay here to take a short break uh, and say, can we pause? That is not stonewalling. That's saying I'm getting physiologically flooded here emotionally. I can't do this right now. I need to take a break. Uh, and that's absolutely helpful. That's an antidote. But continuing then, you know, if there's, if the short break turns into permanent and stonewalling and you don't get that opportunity, then again, that gets back into our negative uh, approaches. So again, we're trying to stay away from these four things and we're trying to work on these things. And again, all of these connect with our styles that we're using. So I've got a few other strategies I want to mention that can be helpful, but what questions do you have at this point or anything that you want to clarify or talk about before we continue on? And Amy, if there's a hand, let me know. Or again, just unmute yourself and jump in, you all, if you have any questions.
Neely, and before you shift, not a question, but as we look at the building a culture of appreciation, sometimes recognizing your emotions, your mood, your tiredness, how your day is gone can help you be able to say, whew, as I go into this next meeting, it may not go well. And then actually taking that time out before you go to that meeting to sit down and say, okay, let me appreciate why I'm going to this meeting. I get to have a voice. I get to sit at the table or sit in the Zoom. I'm going to learn from my colleagues. I get to see people who I haven't before and then take that time to help adjust your mood before you go into it. Because if I go into it mad, tired, and frustrated, guess what I'm going to be in the meeting? Mad, tired, and frustrated. And I bet everybody else will be too as we leave. But if I take that time to stop, recognize those feelings, and then purposefully not bring them in with me to the meeting and start appreciating why I can be there, it can help change the tone and help me not engage in conflicts that I might be working to create just based on the mood that I have. Yvonne, sure, go ahead. Okay, so Amy, you just said, I want to be calm and blah, 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 to not engage in conflict. But if conflict is always going to happen, why am I trying to avoid it? Well, well that's sometimes that's I can build it, right? Mm -hmm. So there are times where I can go into something and I'm just going to create conflict but I'm not even paying attention to what the meeting's about. And so there are times in my life where I recognize Amy's full to the brim and you could smile at me wrong and I would start a conflict with you. And so I have to recognize that, that I'm in the mood to create conflict. Why? Because of what's happened earlier. But I can't bring that and dump it on you because you don't have control of what's happened to me all day. And so part of what we have to do is not transfer our work conflict onto our relationships at home or transfer a conflict that we have with a colleague onto the next student who walks into our office. Because sometimes power wise, I may have more power in another context. And so I'm gonna engage in the conflict there, but not engage in it and avoid it somewhere else because I don't know if I could win that one. And so I transfer conflicts to other people instead of actually dealing with the conflict where it needs to be dealt with. Does that make sense? Yeah, I missed that part of the argument, I guess. Well, um, and Yvonne, again, if you're going into that meeting and like you said, sometimes conflict is inevitable, us being able to assess ourselves, our emotional state, how we're feeling, what our morning's been like, what is our default style? Being aware of all those things then lets us decide how to interact in that meeting. So let's say Amy described the situation where you've had the terrible morning. And even if you've gone through the mental light, don't take that in there. I might make the decision of, you know what, I've got some things I want to share, but I'm probably not my best self right now. I'm going to wait and talk about this later. You know, I'm going to call Yvonne afterwards and, you know, talk about this one-on-one -on -one. or so we don't, conflict does not have to happen in the moment when it's happening. If you know enough about yourself to say, I'm going to hit the pause button. Uh, and a lot of times we don't realize. And again, I guess if, if it's your boss and they're engaging in conflict resolution, I don't know that you say, <laughs> I'm going to pause right here. And this is not a good time for me. Maybe that's not going to work. Some of us might have bosses we can do that with. But if, but when we do have the option, it is okay sometimes to say, not right. Let's not do this right now. Let, let's take Let's take a pause. And um, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask another one? Of course. I feel like our culture in Nashville State is totally to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to speak my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's not always going to go well. Mm -hmm. It's not always going to be good for other people. It's not always going to be good for me. But how do we get past that as a culture and be brave enough to speak up, even though we sound like idiots? Well, I mean, I think that being brave is ultimately it. Uh, and that's whether it's our work culture and our close relationships. Um, 
if we are someone that has not been speaking up, you know, whether it's because of avoidance or accommodation or a combination of both of those, uh, it does take courage to say, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore because ultimately it can damage your work environment, your relationships with your family, friends, uh, but it's hard. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, I, I always like to say when I'm talking about conflict with others, you all, just because we know our styles, just because we're going to talk about some strategies, it's difficult sometimes, especially in a situation where you're not used to speaking up and you're not used to sharing. Um, so I commend you for saying, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with this. Hopefully this information will allow you to think before you speak, to decide how do I want to approach it so that you can decide what you want to say and how you want to say it. Because a lot of conflict management is thinking through our own intrapersonal, our own self. Why am I feeling this way? What am I feeling? What do I want to say? How do I want to say it? Do all that intrapersonally before we put it out. Uh, and to me, I think that's, if I were, if I had to give one tip, uh, and again, there's way more than one, but it would be think before you speak, how do you feel about it? What do you want to say? In what context? And if you're in a situation where conflict's happening and you said you don't want to avoid it, but you know, at that moment, you haven't gathered your thoughts. Again, it is okay to temporarily pause, make a note to yourself. I want to address this, but right now it's not, I'm not going to be my best or it's not going to be exactly what I want to say. You can circle back around. You don't only have that one opportunity. Uh, and so th that's what I would suggest. Um, is that helpful? Honestly, it's helpful for me 